Well, good afternoon, guys. I'm happy to be here to talk to you guys. Um, and hopefully you'll get something out of it. Um, at the end, if there's any questions, please don't hesitate to just come find me and we'll talk about it. Um, for this first lecture, I'm going to be talking about um, procedural sedation, something that we're all fairly familiar with, hopefully, um, but something that tends to be under a lot of press from ASAP and as far as guiding it, just because it is a dangerous procedure if not taken carefully. Um, I'm going to review just kind of the common medications, when they're useful and what situation, talk about some common misconceptions with procedural sedation, and some pitfalls that often fall into. So there are levels of sedation. Um, this is just a reminder. Minimal sedation, moderate, deep, and general anesthesia. We try to stay out of general anesthesia. That's not what emergency physicians, um, advanced practitioners really want to get into. That's more safe for anesthesiology. So, if you're ever getting into the general anesthesia standpoint, try to get out of it very quickly because we want to steer clear of that. Minimal sedation, I consider that just you know, a little bit of pain medication that's not going to deteriorate the patient from a CNS standpoint, cardiovascular standpoint. Moderate or conscious sedation, you're starting to get a little bit effect from the CNS, so they get drowsy. They should be able to respond um, fairly well. Deep sedation is where you're taking away um, a lot of the responsiveness. You still will respond to very painful stimuli, but really you're largely not responding to that. But they should be protecting their airway. You may have to uh, do some airway interventions from time to time, but really it shouldn't be all that common. And then general anesthesia, you expect airway management. Now, I always have a hard time remembering this, so um, at our institution, we just always say deep sedation, deep sedation, deep sedation, but um, it's good to know kind of the categories. For me, um, I have to use a friend of mine to help me remember what these categories are. So hopefully everyone here has a friend that they can relate to. Um, my friend is Dr. Larevi, if you guys heard from yesterday. So um, every time I think about sedation, I think about my life experiences with Larevi, and I'm gonna share those with you guys right now. Um, so, you know, mild sedation, this is when, again, you've had a little bit of medication. I consider this, you know, the Tylenol, the mode trends, just medication that really isn't going to affect the patient all that much. You get into a little bit of moderate sedation, this is where you should start seeing the patient deteriorate a little bit from a CNS standpoint. So, you know, in this case, Lee's out of it, but if I was to poke him, he'd get upset, he'd push me away, he responds perfectly to pain. There should not be any airway issues at this point. This is what we're aiming for is deep sedation. So this is where you want to see the patient um, out of it, okay? They should be able to breathe on their own. They should be responsive um, from an airway standpoint. There are minimal times where you'll have to intervene, and we'll talk about how to do that. And then you get into general anesthesia, um, and this is, again, where we don't want to be. Um, so as far as preparation, you always want to keep a lookout for these things. You know, past medical history, we ask every patient about that. The key things that you need to look for when doing procedural sedation are cardiopulmonary health, okay, because this comes into what medication you're going to choose to sedate the patient. Um, take special note of patients at risk for sleep apnea. You may not have a patient saying, I have sleep apnea. Most of our patients that have sleep apnea don't know they have sleep apnea. Um, so there are certain things that you'll look for which we'll talk about. The last meal is just something we always ask about. We're going to talk about the importance of last meal in a little bit. Um, but it's always just good to know when the patient last ate, how much they ate. Look for difficult airway features. When I talk about that, we're talking about patients who have a lot of facial hair, lack of teeth. Okay, So we know that when someone does not have teeth, they're more difficult to bag mask easier to innovate, more difficult when we're not planning to innovate the patient. Um, small jawline, small neck area, obese patients, those are the ones that are gonna be um, a little bit more concerned from a sedation standpoint. Always have your equipment ready. Um, and by equipment, I mean everything that you would need to intervene from a patient standpoint from airway. So have your oral airways, have nasal airways, have your suctions out just in case the patient begins to vomit, um, have bag mask out, and then have stuff that you need to go ahead and put in, in a tracheal tube in that you're ready to do that. Reversal agents, you know, we don't, there's not a ton of reversal agents when we talk about the actual sedation medications, except for, you know, the fentanyl versa. So Narcan is always a good thing to have on standby. Um, Lunazinil, plus or minus, depending on the patient's history. Um, but just think about it, not necessarily have to have it out. Push dose pressors, um, you know, if you're using a medication that you know is going to cause some cardiopulmonary collapse, like propofol. Um, it's a you know elderly patient that there may be some concern. Go ahead and pull out a little bit of push dose epi or a little bit of push dose phenylephrine, just so that you can reverse any unstable hypotension or cardiac compromise. And then you want to have <coughs> monitoring on every patient. Now you know some people argue, hey, I'm going to use ketamine. I'm using a low sub you know, sedation dose. Do I really need to have them on monitoring? Yes. You know, if, if 
you're doing any kind of sedation and you're doing it for the standpoint of sedation, it's always safer just to have the patient on a monitor. Um, it's just a good thing to be. To be. We'll talk about internal CO2 in a bit. Um, in my opinion, you should always have a patient on internal CO2, and we'll talk about why. So when you're prepping the patient for sedation, um, you want to have make sure they're in the good position. Okay, so this is just an example showing a bad position and a good position. Kind of the ear to sternal notch is what you're looking for. And this is not just for patients that are obese. Okay, every patient that I'm doing this on, I tend to um, push them up just a little bit because you guys know the most common complication is when the patient becomes <coughs> apneic or hypoxic. And the first thing that you guys go and do is jaw thrust it. But if you already have them in a position where you're opening up the airway, it just makes it a lot more beneficial when you're doing the jaw thrust and it kind of opens up the airway to help prevent those episodes of apnea or hypoxia. Malapati score, we use it as a predictor for difficult intubation. It's also a great predictor of those patients that have sleep apnea. So the higher your malapati score, the more likely you are to have sleep apnea. And it actually correlates better than difficult airway for intubation. So take a look at the malapati document it, and it'll just give you an idea of how aggressive you need to be on getting your patient ear to sternal notch and being ready to do maneuvers to open up that airway. So the ASA classification, this is an anesthesiology classification. And in general, you know, we look at stages one through four. We don't really get into the five and sixes from the ER standpoint. Um, if you are, be very, very careful. Um, usually we don't want to be sedating patients that are level four. For all intents and purposes, those should be sedated in the OR under anesthesiology guidance. So I stay clear away from the four unless I absolutely have to do it. Ones and twos are safe ground. Threes, you should always question, okay? So when we talk about three, we're talking about severe systemic diseases. So patients who have prior cabbage history, you know, dialysis patients, um, those that are constantly having monitoring of their chronic conditions. So let's talk about medications. And I'm gonna do this through a case-based scenario so that we just kind of prompt some thinking about what medication would be good for what patient. So this is not an uncommon occurrence. You have a 45-year-old, he's got some medical history, hypertension, diabetes, he has a trimal fracture. Orthopedics has seen the patient and they are asking for sedation to do a reduction because they don't think he needs to go straight to the emergency room or to the OR. Um, they predict it's gonna be about five to 10 minute um, reduction time. And so in the back of your head, you're already thinking. Now, one of the pitfalls that we have is we get used to one medication and we always go to that one medication. So some docs always use ketamine and it doesn't matter what they're using it for. If it's a sedation, they go straight to ketamine. Some docs use propofol. No matter what the sedation is, they go straight to propofol. And that's fine. If it's what you're comfortable with, it's what you've done, keep doing it. But this is more just to get you thinking about other medications that might be better off for certain situations. So in this case where you know it's gonna be a slightly longer procedure, and we all know tri mouse when orthopedic says five to 10 minutes, sometimes it ends up being 15, 20 minutes. So you want a medication that's gonna last for a while. So ketamine in this case would be something I would consider. Okay, it's not the right choice. There is no right choice. The right choice is whatever you choose, but ketamine would be a good one. It's known as the safest sedation medication when we're talking about prolonged procedures, okay? The reason it is known as the safest is because it maintains your airway response. So you don't deteriorate that airway response. In most cases, we'll talk about a few where you might. Um, so when you're thinking about a sedation that's gonna take extended periods of time, you know, ketamine is usually the one that I'm gonna jump to pretty quickly. The dosing is fairly simple, one milligram per kilogram IV, four to five milligrams per kilogram IM um, is sufficient to get that patient sedated. Um, you don't need additional analgesia, so ketamine works on your NMBA receptors as the antagonist. It does diminish pain as well, so we can actually use subtherapeutic sedation doses of ketamine for pain treatment, okay? And we see that quite commonly in the literature recently. So safest medication, prolong, it does cause that dissociative state. The side effects that we know about, apnea. So when we talk about apnea, it's usually under two pretenses. One, you're pushing it very quickly. So we know a quick push of ketamine right off the bat instead of that kind of slower push can lead to apnea. It doesn't happen on every patient, but it does happen more often than not. So when the nurse is pushing it or when the physician is pushing it, if you just push it slowly, you will prevent that or diminish that response. <laughs> we also see apnea a lot when you put ketamine with other medications. So if you're pre-treating the patient with morphine, Percocet, fentanyl, or you're combining an opioid with ketamine, that's where we tend to see the effects of a patient going apneic or losing their airway response. Um, very rare will you see it with just straight up ketamine. It is sympathomimetic, so you're gonna see that surge in high in blood pressure, see the surge in heart rate. 
The good thing about this is if you have a patient who is septic and they're already hypotension, hypotensive and you're not wanting to use a medication that's going to deteriorate that cardiovascular compromise even more, this would be a great medication to use. Um, but just realize if you're talking about a 90-year-old female who has underlying heart problems, she's a cabbage patient, she's got aortic stenosis, and you give this medication, now you're causing an extra burden on the heart because you're increasing that blood pressure, increasing that heart rate. So it may not be a great choice for a 90-year-old female that you're doing a sedation on. So just something to think about. Emesis and hypersalivation, we'll talk about it um, a little bit more. Increased ICP, we'll talk about it as well, and then the emergence phenomenon. So this is talking about adding analgesia, other pain medication, opioids along with ketamine. I've heard both sides. I've heard some docs say you absolutely need to add another medication because ketamine and itself is not enough to control pain. Other people completely against it. Um, when I went through and looked at the actual literature, there was this great article which compared straight up ketamine to therapeutic doses of morphine at 0.1 milligram per kilogram, and they found from a pain standpoint, there was no difference, just statistically similar. Um, but the outcomes of using a pain medication cause more complications, such as apnea, decreased respiratory compromise. So, um, recommendation from ASEP is you don't need anal um, additional analgesia when using ketamine. Ketamine itself is sufficient. What about the increased ICP? Um, this is something that has become medical dogma. It's something that we were all trained about. Um, they're all based on animal studies back from the 1960s and pretty poor animal studies at that. But for whatever reason, it became what we knew and what we were taught in medical school and residency is, hey, you have a patient, you're concerned about increased intracranial pressure, you should not, it's contraindicated to use ketamine. Recent studies over the past five, 10 years have started to refute that. It's still not out of the medical dogma. Um, my medical students that go through Medical College of Georgia, they still learn ketamine cannot be used in patients that have increased ICP or concerns for it. So it's still in the dogma, it's still being taught in the medical system. Just realize it probably is not true. There are some people that actually think it's protective because it increases cerebral pressure to the brain. And so it can be seen as protective. Um, not, no studies to back that up either. In general, just know it probably is not going to cause worse outcomes if you have a patient that has concern for increased ICP, but from a medical legal standpoint, if you have another option, just because it's in the dogma, I'd probably go with the other option at this time. Okay? But you have enough to back you up if you do use it, I think. Emergent reaction, um, it's quoted in the literature anywhere between 10 to 30 percent. The highest studies I've seen are 30 percent, usually 10 to 20 is what we see. About 1-2% to of those are considered clinically significant. I've never seen a clinical significant emergent reaction, but the people that I've talked to that have seen it, it is pretty impactful and pretty memorable for them. Um, I think that the physician who's on the end of that tends to have more PTSD than the patient themselves, um, but that's just, um, again, I've never seen it. I've been out for five years now, so and I use ketamine quite often. Benzos is what we use to treat the emergent reaction. So when I talk about emergent reaction, we're talking about, you know, some people say it can turn a patient into acutely psychotic. They come in, they're aggressive, they don't know what they're doing. Benzos is how we treat them. And we know benzos work on those for the most part. Very rarely do you need anything besides benzos. Um, and it makes sense, you know, benzos is what we use for most of those kind of, um, you know, acute psychosis, acute emergent reaction type things. Problem is, if someone looked and said, well, if we know it treats it, what about if we pre-dose patients that are on ketamine with benzos, and that should decrease the occurrence of it? That did not show to be true, um, and also increased complications with the sedation. So just remember, if your patient goes into emergency reaction, which is rare, but if it happens, benzos is a treatment, but pre-treating with benzos is probably not the best idea because it hasn't been shown to decrease occurrence of emergency reaction. Interesting though, there was one thing that showed a decrease in emergency reaction, and this is one study um, that was done, and they took the patients, and this was not in the emergency room, so it was in the OR, so um, you have to use it for what it's worth, but they coached the patient. They basically said, we're giving you ketamine, pick a topic, any topic that you want to dream about that's happy. They talked about what's going to happen, they said, you're going to be down, you're going to dream about this topic, and as the patient was going under, they kind of coached the patient. They said, now you're going to your happy place, and you're going to come back out. They found that when they did this, zero patients had any kind of emergency reaction. So, you know, if you talk to the patient about Disney World or about wherever they want to go, um, you're a nice physician, they may come out and have a very good case. Right before their sedation, you throw something in their face that you know they're probably not going to like. Um, and, you know, you may be anti-Trump, you may be pro-Trump, but everybody says, you know, 
There's a little bit of fear somewhere in everybody about Trump. <laughs> it may uh, throw you into a Ted Bundy state and uh, make you give me some time. So when you're giving ketamine, just coach, talk to the patient, let them know what's going to happen, kind of coach them into it. And um, if anything, that's going to be the thing that helps them out. So that's ketamine. Let's talk about a different case. We got a 60 year old now with a hip dislocation. This 60 year old has no other complications, but she does have a history of coronary artery disease. I didn't really specify how bad a coronary artery disease, but she's 60 years old, hip dislocation. So right off the bat, we know hip lift dislocations in general don't take a tremendous amount of time for sedation. It should be a full pop back in, usually a couple minutes, um, as long as it's not artificial hip or there's some unfounded complication. <coughs> so you want something that's quick acting. So Atomidate for a 60 year old who has coronary artery disease is a great choice simply because it is cardio protective. There's not going to be any fluctuations in your blood pressure. Um, we use half the dose of Atomidate that we would use for innovation. So we're used to that 0.3 milligram per kilogram. Let's cut it in half and that would be your sedation dose. <laughs> it comes off very quickly. So I mean we're talking about five minutes for this to five to ten minutes for it to wear off. If you ran into problems, it's one where you could bag the patient through the complications until the medication wore off. You wouldn't need a reversal agent. Um, it does not have any analgesia, so if you're looking for pain control, you're going to have to add something as far as to help control the pain, usually sufficient to give it after the procedure, um, because the accommodate will knock them out, so they're not going to have any remembrance, and then you give them some pain medicine as they're waking up. They tend to do very well. The one caveat is it can cause this myoclonus, which makes it bad for orthopedic procedures that you're planning to use for a while. So if you're trying to reduce a tri-malfracture or relocate a posterior elbow, um, you know, where you know you're going to be pulling for a little bit of time and that you need complete muscle relaxation, probably not going to be the best choice. Some people would even argue with the hip, maybe not the best choice just because you need to fight against all those muscles that are putting the hip together, but still a choice. Um, really accommodate is my go-to when I'm doing cardio versions. So if I have an AFib patient, something that's quick, knocks them out really quickly, and accommodate is what I'm going to use. Cardio protective, so when you're shocking the heart, it's great to have a drug that's not really affecting any other part of the heart. Um, so that's one good choice. The other choice would be propofol. Okay, and this is one I think probably most people are familiar with when we're doing orthopedics. This is my go-to for orthopedic procedures that are going to be quick because it does give you that full muscle relaxation. Um, the patient's not going to be fighting you. It's fairly easy to use propofol. It's very titratable. If you overshoot it a little bit, it doesn't take long for them to come out of it. Um, you know, propofol runs into problems when you have patients who are on chronic pain medications or have a history of drug abuse, stuff like that. Um, but for the most part, it's fairly good. Um, it is quick, so again, if you overshoot it, this is the patient you can bag, um, mask if you need to until the medication wears off. You're not needing a reversal agent. Um, it is easier to titrate than atomidate. Atomidate's more of an on or off. You just give it, and then you're done. Propofol, you give your first first dose, but then you need to titrate it, otherwise that medication wears off, and then you have to restart again in the rebolus. Um, one side for propofol, be careful in your severely obese patients. There is a lot of literature out there where if you're giving their total body weight, which is often too much for obese patients, it gets stored in that fat and then it just releases, um, and so then they stay under for a lot longer than you want them to stay under. So. Ideal body weight is probably the best way to dose it instead of their actual body weight, depending on how far off it is. Um, and then hypotension is the biggest side effect that you need to be ready for. Ketofol is one that you're going to hear about. Um, it's one that I use not infrequently. It's the combination of protofol, uh, propofol and ketamine. The thought behind it was you have propofol, which is a short-acting one. That will get them knocked out very quickly. And then you have ketamine to kind of prolong that sedation effect. So if you have a patient that you're looking to do a sedation that's not just a quick one, it's going to extend a little bit of time, using in combination could be beneficial. Um, theoretically, it's less side effects. So you know it's cardioprotective because you have propofol, which is lowering your blood pressure, the ketamine, which is increasing your blood pressure, so they cancel out each other, the thought process. Um, and you really, because you're given half the dose of each of these medications, the overall complication is thought to be lower. Um, I've had some patients where I've used ketofol and it really hasn't had much of an effect, and then I end up just switching over to a full propofol um, mindset. So, you know, pros and cons for ketofol. I don't know how much experience people have with it, but it's kind of hit or miss in my experience. Um, it is a one to one solution, so um, it's very easy to mix up. The last one I'm going to talk about is um, Presidex. We don't see a whole lot of Presidex used in our ER. 
Um, I haven't seen that used in many ERs. It's one that you will see anesthesia use a lot, and it's becoming more popular for the pediatric world. Um, you know, in the pediatric world, ketamine is kind of the go-to, and that's what most of us tend to use. The problem with ketamine is if you're doing it, patients are moving around still, okay? We always tell patients when we're getting ketamine, don't be surprised if your kid moans and groans and screams from time to time. They have their eyes open, they're gonna be jittery. We expect that with ketamine. Presidex, it acts almost like ketamine in that it causes a dissociative-like state, except for now you're not getting all the movements that you get along with the ketamine. And so, you know, this is becoming more popular when we talk about the kids going to the MRI where you need to be very still, or ENT needing to do, to do sedation for suturing, you know, intraorally. We're seeing Presidex used a lot more for that. And so just something to think about. Um, it does cause hypotension, bradycardia, and heart block. It's almost similar to propofol in that manner. It does have a little bit of pain control to it, so you don't all, you don't typically need to add additional pain medication to it until after the sedation is done. So those are the common drugs that we use. Now, I purposely left out fentanyl versed, um, and I know fentanyl versed is something that's used out there. It is probably the most difficult to titrate because you are com you're combining two medications into one, and both of them are very sporadic in how well they control a patient's um, pain and sedation level. So fentanyl versed, I think it's great if you're doing just a mild procedure where you're not having to knock the patient out completely, more for that mild sedation, you know, abscesses and laceration repairs. But when we're talking about full-blown deep sedation, for me personally, it's, it's just too unpredictable and so I try to stay away from it. There are, if you just go through the literature, the complications are more with fentanyl versed than there are for any other medication, simply because, again, you're using two medications you never know which one is going to affect the patient more than the other. So common misconceptions, I'm going to shoot through this pretty quickly. Um, the first one is we go into the mindset very often of thinking procedural sedation is the same as a rapid sequence innovation. And what I mean by that is when we see that apneic episode or we see that patient becoming hypoxic, the first thing that we do is we run to the bag mask and we start bagging the patient. And that's our second nature because we do much more rapid sequence innovations than we do procedural sedation. And if you're in a rapid sequence situation, if a patient becomes hypoxic, you need to reach for that bag and get that patient oxygenated back up. Problem in the sedation patient is they're not paralyzed. We're not paralyzing this patient. So for all intents and purposes, right before they become apneic, they've been breathing through the sedation period um, and they have you've overshot just a little bit to cause that respiratory compromise. If you have them on capnography, you're gonna pick it up a lot sooner before they become hypoxic. Um, and again, they're not paralyzed. So moving straight to bag mask typically will cause problems that you don't want to, and specifically I'm talking about vomiting, okay? So there's other things that you want to think about before you jump to bag masking in the sedation patient. Jaw thrusting is going to be the first one. So oftentimes we're seeing hypoxia or apnea secondary to positioning. So if you give them a jaw thrust, you're also listening in a little bit of a painful stimuli, which is usually enough to wake that patient up and get them to start breathing, and you don't have to worry about bag masking that patient. If that doesn't work, you know, typically we're doing this for a orthopedic procedure or some kind of painful procedure. So if you just initiate a little bit of pain that pushes them over that pain threshold, it's enough to get them breathing again just um, until you can resolve the apneic hypoxic air episode. Putting in a nasal or an oral airway, um, probably more a nasal airway in this case, um, would be something I would try to do before the bag mask. Again, it causes that nauseous stimuli, which is usually enough to wake the patient up. And then bag mask, if you have to do it, do it slowly. Try not to let your epinephrine get the best of you and start bagging them like crazy. Um, you know, slow, easy breaths, just enough to get them through that episode, which is usually not that long. So my approach, you know, you want to detect it early. You detect it early with CO2. So CO2 capnography, you can see when the patient stops breathing before they become hypoxic. Stop the drug, so if you're given a drip of anything, a drip of propofol, or you're giving them Presidex, stop the drip. Um, ensure that the patient is properly positioned. Jaw thrust, suction, painful, painful stimuli we talked about. At this point, if it's still not working, you can consider your reversal agents if you have them. Bag masking or LMA would be far off as the last option that we talked about. And then ultimately, if things are just going really, really bad, you can innovate the patient. Um, suboptimal in these situations. Um, also, going back to kind of our train of thought, we often walk into this misconception of sedations are less risky than rapid sequence intubations. 
Um, the problem with this is if you walk in with that mindset, you know, we walk into rapid sequence innovations knowing this patient is going to get a tube. So we have our suction out, we have our advanced airway, we have a backup airway, we have everything ready um, because we're expecting the worst. But if you walk into a procedure sedation thinking everything's going to go well, you typically forget to have those backups ready. And that's where the problems come in is you're not ready to act when something goes wrong. Um, and so just remember, it, it's actually the reverse. Sedations are actually more worrisome. They should be more alarming simply because you need to be ready for those things to go wrong. You're not expecting to innovate this patient. You're not expecting bad things to happen to this patient. So you need to be ready in case something does happen. Um, elderly patients, this is just always be um, mindful that elderly patients are going to be more sensitive for the most part to medications. Uh, not always true. I just sedated a VA veteran that was 80 years old that I think I used more propofol than I've ever used on any patient um, a couple weeks ago. So not always the case, but in general, half the dose is where I start with any elderly patient older than 70 or 80. Okay, so what about fasting? Um, you know, this is anesthesia world. So patient cannot be sedated four to six hours after a big meal. Um, that does not hold true for the emergency room. Um, the literature behind that's actually not very good either. This is ASEPS. They actually looked at this. They looked at all the research and they found that it doesn't really matter what time the patient ate. It didn't change complications associated with procedural sedation. So, um, you know, it's always good to know just in case, but really it should not have an effect. You should not <laughs> prolong someone who needs a sedation just because they ate recently. Um, and this is, again, this is ASEP's policy. They gave it a level B recommendation, which is pretty good. That means it's backed up by some literature. Um, but procedural sedation, pre-fasting, really does not demonstrate reduction of risk for emesis and or aspiration um, when doing procedural sedation. Capnography, so I'm a big proponent of capnography. Again, you can determine if a patient is not breathing much quicker, way before they become hypoxic with the use of capnography. I don't do any sedations without capnography. Literature does not support me. Okay, the literature shows that it may reduce complications, um, but really didn't show to reduce serious adverse events. Um, I just think it's something safer. I mean, there are a lot of things that we do in medicine that doesn't necessarily show safeness, but you just kind of know in the back of your head, it's safer. Um, so for me, being able to recognize when a patient is not breathing quicker, I think is a better thing, rather than waiting until they become truly hypoxic. Um, ASEP's policy, this is a level C for how many people need to be in the room, two. So there needs to be a nurse or someone who's qualified to record and keep a continual look at the monitor. And then you need the physician or advanced practitioner who is, knows about the medications, knows what to do when the medications are overactive or you're going down the wrong pathway. Um, and the last thing, this is just the medications that ASAP has said that they will back up from the standpoint of the emergency room. So level A, ketamine, safe for kids, propofol, safe for kids and adults. Level B, um, ketofol and atomidate for both kids and adults. And then level C would be ketamine for adults, atomidate for kids, and fentanyl, which I said it's not a big um, one that I use often. but So those are the ones that ASAP gives um, their recommendation for. Any questions, guys? <coughs> Oh my god, on sedation. Alright, thank you.